Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. My guest is Ron Whitehurst. He is co-owner of Rincon Vitova Insectaries. He is a project leader at the Dietrich Institute for Applied Insect Ecology. He's a licensed pest control advisor, a permaculture practitioner, and an avid gardener. His company has won the Regenerative Business Prize in 2016, and he is a member of numerous associations, including the Entomological Society of America, the Association of Natural Biocontrol Producers, and Seed Savers Exchange. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Most people don't like insects, don't want them around, consider them pests, but you love them. Why? Think about our main product. Uh, we grow 5 million flies every day, and then we grow this little wasp that eat them. Do you like flies? Well, I don't like them when they're buzzing around me. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so when you think about it, that's a, a, an excellent opportunity for someone to grow the flies and then grow the wasp eats them because people will be really motivated to purchase a little uh, wasp that we grow to control the flies. So we do things backwards. Everybody else is trying to get rid of these pests and then we work real hard to grow the pest, but then we grow the beneficial insects that eat that pest. And so what we do is called biological control. They're using the natural enemies of a pest to control it. We've kind of gotten off the beaten path. Well, with uh, World War II, the chemical companies produced uh, large amounts of nitrate for explosives and these toxic materials for nerve gas and such. And so after the war, we hammered our swords into plowshares. We uh, turned the nitrate explosives into nitrate fertilizer and the uh, chemical agents of death into uh, pesticide. We are living with this legacy of this tremendous strength of, of that industry that has taken over our uh, educational schools, our land-grant universities, the Cooperative Extension Service. Indeed, the agricultural schools seem to be promoting pesticides and insecticides instead of what you're promoting, which are beneficial insects that eat the insects that we don't want eating our crops. Right. When you think about it, it's a disservice to both to, to us as, as the um, public that is having to live with this tremendous burden of uh, pesticides in our environment and to the environment that we're decreasing the biodiversity of our lawns, our farms, and our uh, cityscapes, our parks and such by using these broad spectrum toxic pesticides. We're on a mission to encourage people to work with nature instead of trying to beat her into submission. There are over 20 million species of insects in the world and there are probably even more that haven't even been discovered or cataloged in the museums and the scientific labs. But you focus on just a handful, about 50 beneficial mm -hmm. insects in your catalog and you even focus more specifically on three species of fly parasites, the parasites mm -hmm. that eat the flies that we don't like, ladybugs mm -hmm. for scale, and lacewing. And mm -hmm. we've heard about ladybugs being not only a cute little insect, but a beneficial one. Why mm -hmm. are they so important? What do they do? Ladybugs, there's about 250 different kinds of ladybugs in, in North America. They're all predators. That means that what they eat is, is other insects. They're interested in eating meat. So they are not interested in eating the plants that we grow for food or the, the plants we grow for ornament, for flowers and such. So they're beneficial insects. Most of the ladybugs, looking at the example of the convergent ladybug, the main ladybug of commerce that's uh, collected in huge quantities up in the mountains where it hibernates during the wintertime, are predators both in the larval stage and the adult stage. And so it's very common for people to go to a garden center and get um, a bag of ladybugs and put them out in their garden to help control the pest. So that's a nice thing to do, but then if you just have some diversity in your garden, a variety of different uh, flowering plants, 
you can draw the uh, beneficial insects to your garden. Wherever people find honeybees, they enjoy the product of those bees, even if they don't like being stung by them. Is this common to have both a beneficial aspect of an insect as well as a not so great aspect of them? Sure, yeah. There's lots and lots of examples. When you look at the relationships of the pest insects and the beneficial insects and such, it's not a straight line, but it's more like a three-dimensional network that we have ants that are, you know, kind of irritating pests in our homes and they um, will farm the aphids out in our uh, garden, on our roses and on our cabbage plants and such. But they also compete with termites that are trying to eat our homes. And so we don't want to totally eliminate ants, but we want to manage them to a low level so that we can grow our garden, plants in our garden, and produce good food and keep our uh, house from being falling apart due to uh, termites eating all the wood. You mentioned ants, and nobody likes to see them crawling into the homes. And so many people say, take out this chemical and spray it on them. And I've Mm -hmm. learned that all I have to do is wipe them up and get rid Mm -hmm. of the source of food that they're going to, usually Mm -hmm. my cat food. Yep. And if you want to pull out some kind of spray material, uh, go for it. Take some vinegar. It could be apple cider vinegar or white vinegar. Mix it one part of vinegar to four parts of water. Put that in a spray bottle. And uh, when you see a trail of ants, just uh, spray the trail with the vinegar water. And it will burn their antenna. And they'll think, oh, no, this is a horrible place. I got injured here. I, I need to stay away from this area. So they'll take the message back to the colony that, oh, no, avoid this house. You get burned up there. Let's talk a little bit about this integrated biocontrol method, particularly Mm -hmm. for flies, because Mm -hmm. apparently they have four life stages, and you have to Mm -hmm. understand those stages in order to Mm -hmm. deal with them in their different stage. Mm -hmm. How do you go about that? Right. So there's four stages to the fly life cycle. There's an egg, larva, pupa, an adult. Each of those life stages is an opportunity to put pressure on the fly population. For the uh, egg stage, you just manage the manure, manure or rotting um, vegetation and that sort of thing. They will grow in like grass clippings that sit around and and start rotting. You know, there's a number of things that they'll grow in. So you you minimize the uh, breeding site for the eggs. For the larva, similarly reduce the uh, breeding sites. For the pupal stage, you can release some of our fly parasites. These are little wasps, and mama wasp goes and lays her egg in the fly pupa. The egg hatches, and the little wasp consumes the fly, pupates inside of the fly pupa, and then emerges as an adult and comes out and starts looking for more fly pupae to parasitize. So that takes out the pupal stage. And then for the adult stage, you can put out the fly traps that have either something stinky or molasses is a really good attractant for adult flies. Just mix molasses, one part molasses with three parts water, put that in one of the uh, fly traps that will attract the flies, but it doesn't uh, smell really horrible what we call the gag me kind of bait. So it's very straightforward to be able to manage flies to a low level. So you can have animals around, you can have composting operation. You raise and sell the parasite that eats some of the flies. What's involved in growing and maintaining insects? How long does it take? What do you have to feed them? How do you have to have a controlled environment for them? Is it a factory farm, so to speak, of insects? We think that it'd be really interesting to have people draw pictures of what they imagine an insectary to look like. A lot of people have difficulty imagining it, as you suggest. So for the flies, we start out with the eggs and we put them on this fly larval food. It's a mixture of bran milk powder and live yeast that we lighten up with rice hulls. We put that in something like a kitty litter pan. The flies grow and develop over a period of about five days and then we flood the trays and the maggots walk out. They want to go to a dry place to pupate. We collect the maggots, let them pupate, and then some of them go back into producing uh, more flies to keep the fly culture going. And then some of them go into cages with these little parasitic wasps. They're only about a tenth of an inch long. They're not big, scary wasps. 
They don't bother people or pets. The females lay their eggs in the fly pupae, and then that's one of the products that we um, send out. We also take some of those parasitized fly pupae and let the uh, wasps emerge, and that's the wasp for the next generation. So we have to keep cycling back either quarter to a third of our uh, production into maintaining our colonies of both the flies and the uh, fly parasites. So how many thousands of insects are you raising every year? Well, every day we're, we're growing about 5 million of uh, house flies. Did I hear that correctly? Five million? Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> you count them? Well, <laughs> volumetrically, yeah. <laughs> There's 30,000 fly pupae in a uh, volumetric quart. So, so we scoop out a quart of fly maggots or fly pupae, and, and that's about 30,000 critters. So we do it that way. I want to learn more about this biological control of our pests with my guest, Ron Whitehurst, who is co-owner of Rincon Vitova Insectaries, when we return in a moment. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Ron Whitehurst. He's a licensed pest control advisor. You are also a permaculture practitioner and avid gardener. Mm -hmm. And the pests are pests sometimes to us and our homes, our person, but for Outside, if we're growing a garden, we want the right insects to be attracted, and so it's important that we plant properly as well. You have advocated that it's important that you know your plants and you plant, because some plants are more attractive to pests than other crop plants. And you also want plants that will attract these beneficial insects that will eat the ones that we don't like. So when somebody is planting their garden, what advice do you give them? I encourage them to mix it up. That uh, it's very common to plant like a, a great big bed of just one thing, you know, like cabbage or broccoli or beans or something like that. But if you put in a little bit of another plant that will have a different scent, a different aroma that will kind of mix up the aroma of the particular garden plant that you're, your crop plant that you're planting, then uh, that will help a lot. So in the case of cabbage, if you plant a little bit of alyssum, like one plant of alyssum for every uh, 10 cabbage plants or broccoli plants, that will provide the nectar for the little parasitic wasps that love to feed on the cabbage aphid and the um, cabbage looper, the caterpillar that eats uh, holes in your cabbage and such. And so just mixing it up will be a big advantage. And the greater the diversity that you have in, in your garden, the more that you'll be able to support a diversity of beneficial insects. And with a diversity of beneficial insects, uh, there'll be something that will be feeding on your pest. If you see pests growing on a plant, you need to ask yourself, okay, there's five or six different predators that should be eating that. There's four or five parasites that would love to feed on that pest and, and take it out. And there's four or five different kinds of diseases, these fungi that eat insects that should have taken out that pest insect. So how can I shift the balance to favor the good guys over the bad guys? Obviously, permaculture practitioners like yourself advocate working with a variety of plants to provide a habitat for the beneficial insects and that means you have to have the annual the perennial the tall Mm -hmm. the low growing Mm -hmm. the inexpensive Mm -hmm. the showy the tolerant of traffic etc and that these mixes can be used as hedge grows strips patches understory Mm -hmm. to draw the beneficial insects to areas near crops to help with that biocontrol of diverse pests Mm -hmm. is there a particular pest that's worse for are agricultural crops than another? Well, locally, we're working with the uh, Asian citrus psyllid. It's a little insect that sucks the juice out of the uh, uh, orange trees and, um, you know, very easy to control, just like an aphid, to put out some lacewing, some ladybugs, some parasitic wasps, and and it'll uh, take care of it. 
But uh, when you step back and look at what we've done, we're, we're not growing healthy plants. And so the basic organic uh, principle is that a healthy plant resists pests and disease. So we're looking at how can we quickly transition these conventional citrus groves into regenerative organic orchards. And what we've uh, come up with is, is that the cover crop would be really, really great approach to getting more life out there. So what we're looking at is a combination of about 20 or 30 different plants that would support each other's growth and have cover the ground with vegetation. That does a, a number of things. First, when it rains, the rain will sink down into the soil and be available there to support the growth of the cover crop and the tree. And then the um, plants will support a wide diversity of microbes in the soil, which will improve the um, tilth of the soil and the health of the citrus trees. And then the flowers on the flowering parts of the, the cover crop will support the beneficial insects that will help to feed on the psyllid to reduce that. So with a coordinated approach of a cover crop uh, using compost for fertility and uh, some hedgerows or insect buffer strips, we think that we can very quickly turn around the problem of the psyllid pest and then the disease. There's been some people that using nutritional methods, they, they've reversed the citrus greening disease that is uh, carried by the psyllid. We can do this. We can have a beautiful environment that produce good food that support the health of the community nearby and grow good food that supports the, the healthy growth of, of the people who eat it. Since most of us don't grow our own food, although we probably should have our gardens in our backyards or front yards, most people have yards that they have to deal with. They have homes mm -hmm. and the insects are all around us. But it's important for us to know what the farmers have to go through. But let's go back to the home. And often people get cockroaches in the house. Mm -hmm. Why and how? And what do we do to control them in a very biological, safe method? In the home, probably the simplest and safest materials to use are boric acid and, and diatomaceous earth. So if you get some powdered or fine crystalline uh, boric acid, you can get it at the hardware store, like pound bottles for like 10 bucks or something like that. And just very lightly dust uh, underneath all of your appliances in the kitchen, you know, like the stove and pull out the drawers of the cabinets and, and dust it around inside the cabinets. That will be really good to reduce the number of uh, cockroaches. The um, boric acid is very toxic to cockroaches, but um, a very low risk toxin for people. So the average 150 pound adult male could probably eat an, a full ounce of boric acid with untoward damage to them. And then another way of using it would be to mix it with sugar and water and put it in a bait station. Uh, that's what we use for ants and it also works for, for cockroaches. On a larger scale for schools, universities, housing, apartments and that sort of thing. They can buy these little parasitic wasps that feed on the egg stage of the cockroach, or at least most of them. It doesn't work on the German roaches, but for the American, Australian, and Oriental roaches, it uh, does a good job on them. So there are some, uh, some biological control for some of these, uh, what we see as household or structural pests. There are millions of species of insects. They have a place in the ecosystem, even the ones we don't like that you're trying to control when they're attacking our food or in our homes. And you've specialized in about 50 of them, some parasites that attack flies, ladybugs, lacewing. What is a lacewing and what does it do? It's called a... Um in the order Neuroptera, neuro refers to nerve, and so it's called literally nerve wing. So the wings look like lace. They're clear with the, this very fine venation that looks like a, a very fine lace. They are uh, really good predators. The green lace wing that we use a lot is a predator during the larval stage, but not the adult stage. There are some brown lace wings that are predators in both the um, adult and the larval stage. We can grow those these in large numbers and supply you the eggs or larvae 
And so you can put them out as a, a general predator that will feed on all kinds of soft-bodied insects, aphids, whitefly, mealybugs, scale, small caterpillars, insect eggs, and so on. And so it can be kind of like a biological pesticide where you put it out and they go out and chow down on, on the pest and bring the numbers down. They will reproduce in the environment. And so if you do a release or two early in the uh, season, then they'll be there in larger numbers for the, the rest of the season. So it's really a wonderful uh, example of a beneficial insect in a number of different ways. Uh, one in, in that it's a, got a wide host range, but also that the adults of the green lacewing are vegetarian. And so why would you want a vegetarian you know, insect coming to your garden? They feed on pollen and nectar and, and the honeydew, the sugary poop from aphids and whitefly and such. And that's because their larvae are vicious predators. They have these pincer mouth parts that are like hypodermic needles. They grab onto these poor hapless little aphids and inject them full of digestive enzymes, liquefy their guts, and then suck out the liquefied guts and then carelessly toss them aside. It's a horrible thing to see, but you know, if you don't like aphids, it's something that experienced gardeners delight in. Going back to when we talked about so many insects and you've been focused on insects when most people don't want most insects around, but we know we have to have them around. We need them. Are there scientists who are finding out about new insects that are beneficial to us that we should have a better appreciation of? Yes, yes. There's still some exploring going on, and, and people are going to a number of areas and, and looking at the different insects around and thinking, okay, what kind of insect is this? And they try to key it out, and they can't find anything just like it so so there's a lot of insects that are just kind of taken for granted that they're just kind of a part of the background and until you start looking at them it's just kind of a, a blur and so we're slowly getting some really good handles on the kind of diversity and so on hopefully we'll be able to catalog them and appreciate them and, and keep their habitat from being totally destroyed before they and, and us go extinct. Obviously, you have a lot of colleagues who love insects. You're a member mm -hmm. of the Entomological Society of America, the Association of Applied IPM. I think that's Integrated Pest Management Ecologists, Association of Natural Biocontrol Producers, California Agricultural Production Advisors, Biodynamic Farming and Gardening Association, and Seed mm -hmm. Savers Exchange. These are all people who understand what you have been promoting, which is good biological pest control, regenerative organic farming. But when are we going to find the agricultural schools, the governmental agencies, the Department of Agriculture promoting these same concepts of using biological pest control and regenerative farming? That's a great question. There's some interesting movement now. So we're coming up against some hard limits of, of what we can do to destroy the environment that we live in and have it continue to support us. So in the Midwest, we're looking at maybe another 50, 60 harvest before the whole area turns into a desert that the soil will no, no longer support the growth of plants. In California, we're really concerned about climate change, and we cannot reverse climate change without increasing the life and the carbon, uh, stored carbon in the soil. And so our, our state has an, uh, several initiatives. There's the Healthy Soil Program that gives grants to farmers to do practices that will increase diversity on their farms and then increase uh, carbon sequestration and biodiversity in their farms. There's lots of people that are sick and tired of being poisoned by these agricultural pesticides drifting across their neighborhood. So all these things are coming together to create a huge block of people that are calling for change in the way that we do agriculture, moving away from an industrial agriculture to one that produces food in harmony with nature. And you are certainly a leader in that area, and I want to thank you for all your good work. You are project leader for the Diedrich Institute for Applied Insect Ecology. Mm -hmm. 
What are you doing? The last project was the Healthy Citrus Workshop. Just as, as COVID shut everything down, we had a workshop looking at all the different aspects of how do we grow healthy citrus. And you grow healthy citrus, so you don't have to worry about the past and disease. One of the sessions, my wife, Jan Dietrich, did a session on what do we know about perennial cover crops for citrus. And our next project will be a full workshop on the various aspects of how to design a perennial mode cover crop for citrus and, and other uh, orchard crops in our Mediterranean environment here. There are some animal activists who want to protect every animal. Do they ever get upset with you that you are raising animals, which insects are, that eat other animals? Yes, we raise animals, these insects, which are small animals, in cages. We do go to great lengths to make sure they have a uh, good life and so on. But some people do say that, you know, we should not be keeping them restrained and caged up. But the mission is to promote biological control by natural enemies. And so we're using these insects that come from nature, going back out into nature to help people grow good food, fiber, medicine, without using toxic pesticides. So yeah, it'd be nice if we didn't have to do this, but it serves a role in the transition from a chemically-based farming system to a biologically system. There are many larger animals that are endangered and threatened with extinction. Do we have to worry about insects becoming extinct? Yes. I think the more direct concern would be of humans going extinct. So if we don't clean up our act, then the level of poisons in our environment and the climate chaos that we have set loose, set in this snowball rolling downhill, that we may be seeing the last of our culture. And, and that's a hard thing to contemplate. You know, how does a culture deal with its extinction? Most Americans, particularly those living in cities, urbanized, industrialized nations, don't have a close connection to the earth, to their food, to the animals and plants. But do we find traditions where insects are revered in other cultures? Oh, sure. There's quite a few cultures that have more of a nature base to them. And they appreciate insects and, and actually eat them, you know, harvest them. In Southeast Asia, there's a lot of examples of farmers, you know, observing insects and, you know, occasionally catching them and roasting them and eating them. That uh, They're just part of the uh, flora and fauna around them. They're considered high in protein. Yeah, yeah. It's considered by a lot of people the food of the future. There's a lot of people working with crickets and mealworms and such to develop them as a uh, food source. And it's really great supplemental protein. The key, I think, uh, to have that all work would be to find some waste materials that we can feed them so they would biologically process our waste materials and return them to us as good food. Obviously, insects aren't the cuddly pets that we have in our cats and dogs and other domesticated animals, but how affectionate are you with your insects? <laughs> uh, we appreciate them. For us, for the most part, there are animals that we manage, you know, like other people manage cows and pigs and sheep and goats and chickens and such. There are farm animals. How did you decide which insects to have in your catalog because you have over 50? The basic conceptual framework is that our catalog is a toolbox for doing biological control in a wide range of situations. And so we look at the insects that will do a good job of taking care of pests in field situations, in orchards, greenhouse, conservatory, and to a small extent in, in people's houses and put that together so that we can encourage people to, to use these methods instead of reaching for a can of toxic spray that will kill the insects but also destroy the nerves of their kids and pollute the environment. Thank you for being my guest. I appreciate your reaching out and talking to me. We need a lot more people discussing, you know, how can we live with a, a gentle footprint on our planet. I have been speaking with Ron Whitehurst, co-owner of Rincon Vitova Insectaries.
I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.